We come now to the last of the seven letters to the churches in the book of Revelation. I'm joined by J.P. Conway, who will talk to us about uh, the letter to the Laodiceans. J.P., welcome. We're delighted that you made the list of young preachers and uh, really look forward to what you're going to bring to us from the Word. But for those who don't know you, tell us a little about yourself, where you grew up, uh, where you went to school, stuff like that. I grew up in Middle Tennessee, lived most of my life here, and I've been to several schools kind of affiliated with Churches of Christ. I went to Ezel Harding uh, High School and then later to Abilene Christian, enjoyed my time in West Texas, uh, met my wife there. And then uh, after that, we lived in Connecticut for about six and a half years where I served as a youth minister at the Manchester Church of Christ on the east side of Hartford. Uh, my wife did graduate school there in biology, and then we always wanted to be involved with a Christian college, and so we moved to Nashville in 2007. She teaches at Lipscomb in the biology department, and I did youth ministry in Smyrna, uh, which is a suburb of, of Nashville, and now I preach at a downtown congregation here in Nashville. How long have you been preaching now? I've been preaching about four years now. Okay, so when did that impulse, when did that calling first come to you, and, and how did you sense the move of God in your life? To, to call you into the ministry of preaching? That's an interesting question. My calling's taken a variety of forms over okay. the years. I, I first began to feel certain aspects of calling 13 or 14 years old, feeling like mm. ministry was what I wanted yeah. to do. Uh, and then probably like a lot of young people nowadays, I kind of got involved in youth ministry for a while and always enjoyed that. Never saw that as a stepping stone, but I kind of knew that, that one day I would preach. I just... Um, I love the church probably more than anything else in my life. I have just always loved the church. I've always felt at home with the church. I've always felt like the church had my back and um, just always wanted to, to take care of the church and, and be with it. Wow. What do you enjoy most about preaching? I enjoy the, um, the process of going through the text and then having it undress me, shall we say. Um, you know, having been a Christian most of my life, I'm amazed how often it surprises me. Yeah. And often the Spirit works in it to do something, and then it, it works within our body, how a variety of people can come to the same text, and yet God does something wonderful and unifying in our midst that always leads to something. So it's, it's endlessly surprising. So the discovery... Yes. That leads into the sermon and then being able to share the joy of that discovery yeah. with, uh, with the world. Uh, and to see how it plays out in congregational life and in our common life together is yeah. pretty thrilling. Yeah, good, good. Well, uh, without giving us uh, a total uh, outline of what you're going to do, give us just a glimpse of what we're going to hear in just a few minutes. What are you going to want to say to us about the yeah. church at Laodicea? I've really enjoyed the time I've spent uh, studying this in recent months, and the church in Laodicea had become very complacent, mm. uh, and they relied a lot on self-sufficiency, and uh, in many ways it's been like looking in the mirror, uh, and so it's caused a lot of realization in my own life. Well, we're hoping this, uh, these, this series will be useful to churches. It sounds like you're going to talk mm -hmm. to us about some things that that we really do grapple with in, in real churches uh, today. So we look forward now to the message you'll bring. I had been married about a year. Uh, I was 24, my wife was 22. We were serving with a small church uh, far away from home. We were in graduate school. We were on a shoestring budget and a crisis ensued. The hot water heater went out. And you can probably imagine this, a lot of young couples, the first time that something in the house breaks, it wasn't just a crisis, it was a spiritual crisis. There was time on our knees wrestling with what are we going to do and what does this mean? Oh God, did you not bring us to this place to do this ministry? Will you provide for us now with this crisis upon us? How will we fix this? Where will we get the money? And then when God enabled us to get that money. We were able to get a new hot water heater. It was like a miracle had occurred. And there was a lot of rejoicing, and we feasted on the sustenance of God in that moment and in that time. Fast forward 10 years later, we lived in a completely different place. We had a nicer, bigger home. We were both working, and one day the hot water heater went out. And I didn't even think about it. I called a plumber, 
It was fixed within three hours. Went on about my day. I didn't pray. I didn't wrestle with any truth. I didn't get down on my knees. I just went on about my business. And it wasn't a big deal. And as I look at that, a lot had changed in 10 years. I still was walking with the Lord. Uh, in fact, I knew more about God than I probably had before, but my level of dependence had slowly decreased. God was no longer my ultimate sustenance because, to be quite frank, I kind of had things together, and I kind of took pride in that. And as we look at this last letter this morning, we see the same type of thing in Laodicea. Laodicea had it all together. They were the city and the church that were completely sufficient. Laodicea, as a city, had three things every city wanted. They had a, a banking system that was strong, and they had plenty of money. They had fertile, fertile soil for livestock and crops and all the various things that would go with that. And they boasted uh, the most renowned school of medicine in all of the region. They were self-sufficient. When an earthquake hit in 60 AD, they didn't need any handout from the government. They simply took care of themselves. People would come from all around to get the shiny, glassy wool that came from their sheep and livestock. People would come all around to get their carpets and their garments. People would come from all around to get the Phrygian powder, which would help with their eyesight. They did not go to other people. Other people came to them. For Laodicea had it all together. They were a sufficient city. And probably like a lot of our churches nowadays, the church began to take on the personality of the town. And just as the town of Laodicea was self-sufficient, the church became self-sufficient. The church had it all together. And so when we get to this last letter, what we'll discover is the church that had it all together gets the severest reprimand of all the churches. They don't get complimented for anything but instead, they get taken to task because of their pride and their sufficiency. Third chapter of Revelation, starting in verse 14. And to the angel of the church in Laodicea write, The words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's creation. I know your works. You are neither cold nor hot. Would that you were either cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out my mouth. For you say, I am rich, I have prospered, I need nothing, not realizing that you're wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire, so that you may be rich, and white garments, so that you may clothe yourself, and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen, and salve to anoint your eyes, so that you may see. Those whom I love, I reprove and discipline, so be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him, and he with me. The one who conquers, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne, as I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. You may be familiar with the lukewarm theme. Uh, if you're familiar with anything about this letter, Laodicea, that's normally what gets the most treatment. And normally what we think about is how our culture uses the idea of lukewarm. If we tell somebody they're, they're lukewarm, they have lukewarm passion, what we're referencing is hot is to be passionate and exciting and enthusiastic. So when we tell someone, hey, you're lukewarm, we're saying move towards the hot and away from the cold, kind of the lifeless type of aspect. But lukewarm in their day wasn't the idea of lacking passion. Instead, it's a reference to being useless, which is a very different type of notion. They are neither hot nor cold. They're lukewarm, and lukewarm was useless. Nearby in Hierapolis, they had these hot springs, and people would gravitate to these hot springs because they believed the hot springs had medicinal purposes and, and healing power, and they would go to hot springs for healing. And yet 10 miles on the other side, near the area of Colossae, there were these cool waters, and on a, um, 
on a hot summer day, nothing was as refreshing as cool water from Colossae. The cool water was refreshing. The hot water uh, brought healing. But lukewarm was neither. And you didn't really need lukewarm water. Lukewarm water was useless. The church in Laodicea was this way. It was a useless church. They got to the point that they didn't offer any healing, spiritual, physical healing to those around them, and they didn't offer any refreshment of the gospel to, to each other or those around them. They had just become a useless spiritual group of people. They thought they had it all together, and they slowly got complacent. You might say they were the church that just went through the motions. Spiritually speaking, they had grown fat and happy, and they were living off past days. Things were so comfortable in Laodicea that the church got comfortable too. Life in the Roman Empire, hey, it's not that bad. And slowly and in subtle ways, they traded the kingdom dream and the kingdom vision for the Roman dream and the Roman idea of the good life. They got into the Roman dream of prosperity and possessions and popularity instead of the kingdom vision of faith, hope, and love. They continue to dress everything up kind of in Christian language, but really it was the Roman dream they were advocating, not the Christian dream. Today, we might call that civil religion or a health and wealth gospel or even the idea of social or nominal Christianity. So which church is Laodicea today? Laodicea is the church that has it all together. The church on the right side of town in the perfect building with the perfect children's ministry and teen ministry. It's the church that's been there for years, and they have this rich tradition, and they always meet budget, and everything just kind of goes well. It's this person that has grown up knowing the Lord, but their dependence on Christ has slowly decreased as their bank account has increased. It's complacent Christianity. There's no outright heresy going on, no outright false teaching going on. They've just slowly become a useless group of people going through the motions. Simply put, it's the church or the person who doesn't really need Jesus anymore. And the problems of this run deep is John is implying the church is useless. They offer no healing. They offer no refreshment. They're ineffective. And in the context of all these letters, what this means is they're ill-prepared for the coming persecution, and it is near, and it is coming. More than that, though, they're just, they're wrong. They're delusional. They feel like they don't need Christ, and they couldn't be more wrong. And, and John deconstructs their self-sufficiency, or Jesus speaking to John with a mocking tone. Verse 17, For you say, I am rich, I have prospered, I need nothing, not realizing that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind and naked. They say they need nothing, and they couldn't be more wrong. As one commentator puts it, they are beggars despite their banks, blind despite the Phrygian powders of their medical school, and naked despite their clothing factories. And Jesus seeks to snap them out of it. And if you're like me, you have these moments where you need to, to snap out of it. Uh, things are going pretty good. You have a good job, you go to a good, stable church, you live in a nice home. It's, it's the American dream of the good life with the three-bedroom house, the two-car garage, and the white picket fence. And everything is going good, and you're self-sufficient. And everything about the American narrative teaches us to be self-sufficient, but we can get to a place where we feel like we don't need God, and we need to snap out of it. And then, well, if you live in Nashville, you experience the 2010 flood. Or perhaps the doctor calls back and they pick something up on the mammogram. Or if it's 2009, you realize your 401k has become a 201k. Your kids get older and you realize you can't protect them from everything. Or you're a leader of a church and everything was going great. And then disunity reigns and you just can't pull it all back together. Or demographic patterns change and your neighborhood around your building goes from being the best part of town to the worst part of town, just like that. And you realize 
you don't have it all together. What do we do when that happens? Jesus starts here by redefining sufficiency, saying in verse 18, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may be rich, white garments so that you may clothe yourself and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen, and salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. And it's quite staggering here what Jesus says to John. He takes the three categories that they boasted about and took the most pride in, money, clothing, and uh, their eye ointment. And he redefines them. He says, you say you're a rich, have gold in me refined by fire. And the fire, likely a persecution reference, this idea of being rich in Christ, even if it's hard. He says, clothe yourselves with white garments, likely a baptismal reference. Don't get caught up in clothing and all that, but rather take your sense of sufficiency from the fact that you are a child of God and clothed with Christ. And then don't take pride in your medical center or your ointments. Take the salve that I give you to have spiritual vision and to see life through my eyes. It's a clear trifecta. Jesus takes the three things they would boast about, and Jesus redefines them all through a spiritual lens. And the message is clear. You are not self-sufficient, but rather you must find your sufficiency in me. For if you don't, you will not be ready for what happens next. Sure, many of them had not denied the lordship of Christ, and yet they'd become complacent and compromised in small and subtle ways, and they'd slowly adopted the world's definition of success. And we do that way too often in the American church, when we adopt worldly standards of success like the size of our church, the impressiveness of our building, uh, branding or popularity. And when we accommodate in these small but subtle ways, ultimately we're not ready for what happens next because we've gotten too comfortable. A good friend of mine works with refugees in West Nashville, refugees and immigrants. And he talks a lot about his discussions with them and the things that he's learned from them. And the other day he said, you know what, JP? He said, "Um, refugees and immigrants will be the salvation of the American church. I said, Chris, what do you mean by that? He said, because they know what's important. Their faith has been refined. They come here, when they hear one of us talk about persecution, they kind of look at us funny and say, oh, you don't know persecution. Let me tell you about persecution. They know what's important, and they're not impressed by the American dream because they've sold out for the kingdom. And he said, every moment that I spend with them, I am blessed. And my friend warned me, he said, we're not ready. The American church is not ready for what happens next. And honestly, I believe the American church, like Laodicea in many ways, is in a precarious position. For a long time, we've had money and influence. And in a city like Nashville, we've taken pride that we're the buckle of the Bible belt. And there's been a sense of strength and security in that. But as I heard someone say recently, we've been the home team, and we may have to get used to being the visitors. But that should be a familiar place for us. For being the visitor was the place that the New Testament church, it was the place that they found themselves in. We must learn what it means to be an exiled minority, and this is a place that the church has been over and over again in church history, and it is cause for hope for the church has always thrived in that position. There is still time for us, like like Laodicea, to get this message and repent and find our sufficiency in Christ. We see this striking vision of Jesus standing at the door and knocking. And we can take comfort in the fact that Jesus is knocking and he will continue to knock. And the question becomes, will will we answer the door? Jesus wants to eat with us. What starts with a stinging rebuke leads to a compassionate invitation to dine with Jesus. Jesus has not abandoned us in his critique. He critiques us out of love. And then he invites us to sit down with him and eat. But when we sit down and eat with our Lord, we find that a peculiar thing is on the menu. 
For Jesus does not just invite us to eat with him, but to be eaten by him. We do not just eat with Jesus, but we eat the body and blood of Jesus. And no greater act that we ever do shows our sufficiency in Christ more than the taking of communion. All self-sufficiency is a lie. It's a mirage. It's an illusion. It's delusional on our part to think that we have it all together. But every week when we come together and take communion, we in essence say the only thing that keeps us going is this body and this blood. Can we trade our infatuation with the Roman or perhaps the American dream of prosperity and popularity and possessions? Can we trade that for faith, hope, and love? A few months ago, I met with a Lipscomb student who was about to be baptized. He was about the age I was when my hot water heater first went out. His passion was electric. This young man had almost no money or possessions to his name, but the way he talked about Jesus was like they were a good friend, and Jesus had just been in the room, and you just missed him. Like, that's, that's how close he was to Jesus, the way he talked about him. We prayed together, and it was one of the most passionate prayers I'd ever heard. And then, I hate to confess this to you, but I got really jealous. Because I used to pray like that. And I used to be that way. But then, probably like you... I got married, I got kids, I moved to the suburbs, and I learned what escrow means. I think what we have to do is realize that we were that way, and we can be that way again. Like Laodicea, though, we better wake up and find our sufficiency in Jesus. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and eat with him and he with me. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. This is the word of the Lord. Well, JP, thank you. I thought that was a strong word from a strong letter. And, uh, and we're in your debt for, for walking us through the text of, of Jesus' letter to us. Mm -hmm. Today, I've always, you're right, I've always thought of Laodicea as that lukewarm church. Mm -hmm. They were just a little too mellow, kind of sleepy-headed. They mm -hmm. needed to be, you know, pumped up a little bit. But what you're saying to us is not that they were too sleepy, but they were delusional. Mm -hmm. They had an image of themselves as the church of Jesus Christ that, that had very little connection to, much less any dependence upon uh, the Spirit of God or the mm -hmm. presence of Jesus. So I guess a question I have is what, if we recognize this mm -hmm. among ourselves, and I think many of us will, um, what, where do you go from there? Uh, what, what do you do to, to respond to the, to the malaise? Mm -hmm. I think one of the things that we can do, and I referenced in the message my friend that works with refugees, and one thing that I get when I read through these seven letters is what would happen if those seven churches spent more time together and their strengths and weaknesses mm -hmm. kind of rubbed off. And so we have the church in Smyr Smyrna that said, you are poor, but really you are rich. And we get the exact opposite here with Laodicea. And I wonder what would happen if Laodicea hung out with Smyrna. <laughs> and I think one of the things we need to realize today, yeah. specifically for <clears throat> affluent churches that have it all together, that there's a lot to be said when they hang out with marginalized churches. So when we spend time with refugees mm -hmm. and immigrants, or we spend time with churches that are struggling, or we spend time with those that are unhoused, and we spend time with those individuals, it has a sense of kind of waking us up to the gospel through those actions. Yeah. I heard somebody say one time, the trouble with the church today is that the church is not in trouble. Mm -hmm. um, so are you suggesting that, that one of the ways to shake us up a little bit is to get out there in the real world fellowship with a wider uh, you know, part of humanity, including other, you know, families in the kingdom mm -hmm. and just and experience something uh, unlike the, the success yeah. that we've known? I definitely think it requires having a global vision. And in Revelation, persecution is talked about. And there's a tendency, I think, for us now to interpret that through an American lens and interpret perhaps recent events through a lens of persecution. My friends in other parts of the world really encouraged me not to do that. Uh, I can think of recent conversations with an Egyptian friend and a Ukrainian friend who both live here in the United States now. 
and it really irritates them when American Christians <laughs> talk about various forms of persecution here. And, and perhaps there are, are dissatis dissatisfying things that have gone on, and perhaps there's persecution on the horizon, who knows? But I think part of it is spending time with our global brothers and sisters and learning from what they've gone through without having a, a martyrdom wish ourselves, mm -hmm. learning from what they've experienced. Yeah. And maybe that's a, in, in part a function of being so enamored of the American dream that we really interpret persecution through that lens. And then you remind us of some people that, for goodness sakes, are not even impressed with the American dream. So that just challenges us to completely mm -hmm. uh, reevaluate uh, where we find our security, where mm -hmm. we find our, our joy, where we spend our best energies. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I really appreciate that. And another image that you, you closed with, which is so strong, is Jesus standing at the door of the church, mm -hmm. knocking on his church's door, asking to be admitted mm -hmm. in. Uh, and, and the very idea that, that, uh, that we could be a church where we function pretty well without his presence, yeah. with, uh, without his word, without the spirit of God. So if, if a contemporary church, one of our churches was to read this letter and be convicted by it, mm -hmm. and, and I would surely hope we would be, uh, what would the takeaway be? What, what would you like to see in a church or hope to see in a church that reads the letter to the Laodiceans and takes it to heart? I think we have to deconstruct our idea of self-sufficiency and we have to say out loud how we've compromised. I think it begins with leaders being transparent themselves about realizing how perhaps they have compromised and settled for other things. So say it, confess it. Say it, confess it out loud and talk about it and, and talk about the kingdom instead of kind of the subtle aspects where we talk about what we talk about, but then we go in the parking lot and compliment each other's new cars, you know, and there's a hidden message, I think, to that. Um, but also, I think it's about, you talk about Jesus trying to get into his church, letting the word of God and communion set the tone for everything that we do, and letting, letting the word of God be uncomfortable, <laughs> and yeah. let the word of God sting us and let, it, let us go out from that place still being stung and not trying to resolve all aspects of it. But I think Jesus will do the work, um, well, as he says here, if we have ears to hear. Yeah. Oh, that's so strong. Letting the word be the word that, mm -hmm. that like a sword pierces mm -hmm. to the dividing of soul and spirit, bone and marrow. And that's painful. That's surgery. <laughs> yeah. And none of us look forward to surgery. Yeah. But, but if we want the real healing and the real feeding and the real joy of what you've reminded us of mm -hmm. today is that you know we have that physician mm -hmm. we have that lord over us who just really wants to move among his churches again mm -hmm. uh, so thank you for uh thank for, you. for a good word that, that i hope all those who have joined us in this study will will not only find meaning in but find motivation from thank you thank you sir thanks